Hello there. Welcome to another Game Dev London podcast. I'm your host today. As my name is Quang. I'm from Sobi Tech, and our guest today is Dugan from TikiPod. Uh, Dugan, would you mind introducing yourself? Hello. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, I'm a, a, a sort of all-round game developer, and um, I've been working in the industry about ooh, a bit over 20 years. Um, started off, um, went from art college route to uni, did a bit of animation, and then got into doing edutainment games, and then around 2000, headed to London and started working on PS1 and more, more proper games, as some might say, because um, edutainment stuff never felt quite that proper. It was good fun, but it, it didn't feel like real games games. Yeah. I, th I think back then, definitely, there was a quite a separation between education games and, and actual games back then. I think that line's blurred more these days. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and even back then, I think there was a, a version of Rayman, the 2D Rayman, someone had, um, I guess Ubisoft had done it, but um, it was like a, a kind of a poor maths kind of thing. But they used the art from the platformer, which is quite nice. Yeah. So it, looked, it looked very slick. Um, and we, we were doing um, stuff in Lightwave. So it was all um, that whole era of late 90s. Everything must be 3D, but <laughs> it was all 2D pre-rendered. You know? Yeah. Well, it was 3D rendered, but it was all 2D stuff in the director. Yeah. To be that kind of so, market. So the, um, I've asked you along today to discuss uh, how games from the past, or retro games, uh, influence games today. Um, the good, the bad, I guess the ugly as well. Because um, with a career as long as you've had, uh, you've seen the industry, industry change. And the mm -hmm. games you're making now um, have quite a heavy retro influence, I've found. Um, what's your current game you're working on? Um, well, we just finished Astro Aqua Kitty, which is a kind of a spin off of Aqua Kitty uh, Milk Mind Defender, which we did back for PS Mobile. I can't remember how long ago that was, uh, maybe 2014 ish, perhaps. I could be wrong, um, so don't quote me on that. But um, it was a long time ago, and we, we did iterations of that game for successive consoles and improved it each time. And then after that, we wanted to do something a bit different. Um, so the new game is kind of like a RPG light, sort of ARPG, but it's not a very heavy RPG, but it's got arcade stuff in it still, but you explore. So um, it's not a quick, short um, arcade game like the old thing was. You can just dip in and down if it's a bit, bit more involved, a bit more technical, yeah, and a bit, bit, bit trickier to, to make. Um, but we, we kind of wrapped that up and, um, yeah, and so um, that's where we are at the moment, yeah. Which games would you say have influenced Astro Aqua Kitty the most? Do you okay, so a few, um, yeah, R Type, a few IRAM games. You can, if you if you play, you can see there's a few nods to um, R Type and Image Fight from IRAM. Um, yeah, they, they, I mean, R Type was a big game for me growing up. Yeah. Same. Uh, coming across that was was it was phenomenal. The artwork. And the um, also there's the gameplay. Um, so many shoot 'em ups you play in the arcades were, were geared up to you know to hammer your coin uh, in your pocket and take it off as quickly as possible. Whereas uh, I always felt our type was quite fair. It was you know, easy win, and you get access to power ups and things. And then um, sure, if you don't survive, you get splattered. But um, you could you could get by in that game with no weapons. There's a lot of arcade games. You know, if you lose all your power ups and stuff, you can try again. Um, yeah. So. Um, uh yeah, so you say that this game uh, is a bit more meatier in terms of it not being just an arcade shooter. Obviously, R Type is uh, one of those classic arcade shoot 'em ups. Um, yeah. What more have you had to do to to fill it out? So with this game, it's got um, weapon slots. You've got a whole sort of customizable inventory of items you can add, and they all have sort of different buff levels. So that um, your ship can be customized with two different types of weapon and four different types of devices and the devices all have different properties some which are randomized so you, there's a lot of mucking around with different items trying to get the right sort of balance of which weapons work with, with which devices such as batteries or other enhancements um, and your characters on your ship too you can start off the game and you choose two different characters a pilot and engineer and they have different skills they can unlock and they have different um, you know, sort of initial stats as well and you level up by blasting things. So you, if you pick up all the little weak enemies, you can you can push up your XP level. You can gain stronger, more powerful weapons, and then go back and tackle the bigger enemies and stuff. 
Um, so that was a lot more difficult than the last game in terms of testing alone, because you've got so many different variables. You've got to retry and make sure nothing's breaking the game, and, and that was a big um, sort of QA. It was a headache, but it was a, a bit of a work. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's go back to where you started. Um, what would you say were your earliest and strongest influences? And what, get, what sort of games were you playing and what, what, what games were leaving the most impression on you? Okay, well, definitely um, art there's, there's an arcade um, I came across years ago um, that had some really cool stuff in it, like R-Type, uh, Pac Mania, Rampage was really good. Um, and then a, a swing pool we used to visit a long, long time ago. A friend used to take us to, well, it had sidearms, ghosts and goblins, um, some real crack and girl stuff like that. And um, yeah, I, I was lucky enough. I got, I got into the ZX Spectrum quite late. Um, I was always sort of late with the games and consoles and things because um, it was cheaper that way. Whilst everyone else was yeah. getting bored of the things, you can pick them up cheap. And um, there's some great specky games, with, uh, again, our type, of course. Uh, but New Zealand Story, Rainbow Islands, they were all kind of first experiences on Specky, which were yeah, pretty ugly when you look at them now. Um, but they played really well. They were really good uh, yeah. to get into. Again, then, uh, uh, th these games are, um, I think the games you're, you're mentioning are all arcade conversions. So they're like the arcade at home, and, and they have that, again, that arcade feel to it. So. Yeah, uh, they, were, they were good conversions. Obviously, you get a lot of awful ones. Uh, <laughs> As well, like a Black Tiger, I remember that being a fantastic arcade Capcom game. I think it's Capcom. Yeah. I think a Stunt Car Racer was fantastic. Another good one. Yeah. On um, both Specky and Amiga. Really good. Um, so, yeah, for me, it was, it was a mixture of, I think, of, of old arcade games, which were quite a rarity because, you know, didn't have a lot of cash to splash in the arcade. Mm -hmm. It used to be quite expensive. And then Specky games um, were great because they had a few friends at school who were a bit naughty with their tape, tape copy machines. Yeah. Um, but it's great to try things out. You can I couldn't afford having millions of games, but um, um, and the Amiga was a great leap from Spectrum in terms of color Usually. and sound. It's like wow, yeah. different world. It's like you know, back in the arcade land, and games like Turrican and Turrican Two were real proper, you know, yeah. things that pushed yeah. the, the hardware really well and, and made it feel like a proper arcade game. Um, and they were great too. Uh, yeah, Turrican was. I love Turrican. I never. I hadn't played Metroid. It's interesting playing Metroid after playing Turrican, seeing how they yeah, lifted a lot of similarities. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and not not quite as polished, but I kind of like the roughness of the first Turrican. There's lots of kind of um, sort of wonky bits to make it feel kind of uh, yeah more unique, I suppose. So those games you played in the past, um, how would you say they've influenced your game design and and how how you make games? Um, I think all the stuff we've been working on it, um, more recently have definitely been influenced in some way. And part of it's economic because I, when we've been making stuff, I've been doing it with friends. Most of our, I think all our products so far have been, um, for TechiePod games, have been a basic core team of one artist, one designer. We both have kind of you know co-do design in varying degrees depending on the project. It's music and sound, it's a separate... Um, yeah. Um, chap and um, all these old games are kind of influencing in different ways. Oh yeah, and, and part of it's an economic kind of factor because we've got small teams and we don't want to make massive games where we you know spend months and months and years and years making something that ultimately fails horribly. Um, so small products are good, and, and they, that's really good to look at these old games and try and pick things which work well. And uh, where possible, trying to optimize as well. It's quite fun taking a game from your your youth and going, "Well, I really love that game." But if I play it now, it's not quite as great as I remember it was. But how about we modernize a few things um, to accommodate modern tastes and so on yeah. and so forth? Or make the game a bit more meaty. Maybe that game was great, it was an arcade thing for a few minutes, but you try and play it over the whole day. It's like, oh my God, I'm bored. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's been nice. It's just been having that sort of, I guess, background knowledge in your head already and then trying to regurgitate it out and, and uh, massage it into whatever form you want to turn it into to make it something new and fresh. I, I totally agree with you. Um, our game that we're working on, Mamau Castle, is a huge homage to 90s arcade games, especially mm. super scalar games. And we've taken things like uh, um, Space Harrier and made it, ha and had to think about how do we bring this to a modern audience? Because Space Harrier and a lot of the 90s arcade games, as you say, were very quick blasts. 
um, three to five minutes play and you need something a bit more meaty for people now to play at home and, and, and enjoy it quite much longer. So you completely, I completely agree with you that there. That's cool. Yeah, and I found a lot of things as well. The old games, especially arcade ones, they were designed, you know, to take your money yeah. as fast as they could. Um, so things like the Aqua Kitty, we changed it so rather than you having to die and start from the beginning, you just do a level at a time. And if you, you know, succeed, great, you unlock the next thing, and, and you can go off and do something else today because people's time is different now. And that was interesting making um, Iron Cryptical with Dave Parsons, um, which is kind of it's definitely his kind of baby that game. So he he knows the insides and outs much better than I do, like the technicalities of how all things work inside of the game design. But in within it, there are bits which were kind of nods to Rainbow Islands and um, Bubble Bobble in the way that they have the um, the certain items you pick up in certain orders or the way you kill things. All these kind of underlying mechanics are triggering other things to happen, which aren't very obviously apparent. And with those old games, people would pick through diligently and go through and you know discover all these weird quirks. Yeah, the secrets, um, yeah. But nowadays, not everyone has time to do that. So you have to kind of balance the game in a way that um, there's stuff there for people who want to dig, but those who don't, don't feel blocked or like they can't have a good time with it still. Because uh, not everyone has time. Yeah, 